Hi guys, I hope you guys are all safe and sound and you got home okay from this storm. Um, but chemistry waits for no man nor woman. So even though we're not meeting in class today, we still got to get this material covered uh, and you need to do some thinking about it. So I'm subbing in this video lecture for what we would have done in class today. What I'm basically going to have you guys do is if this were class time, you know, we'd look at a couple of slides and then I'd throw a problem your way and you'd kind of pause and try the problem and then we'd talk about it again. We're going to try to replicate this even though you guys are watching this at different times and working on it in different places, um, but we're going to sort of try to replicate that environment. So we're going to jump back into um, what we were working on last time in class. We're not going to have the advantage of talking about it as a group, but we can at least revisit it. And so what I'm going to ask you to do, I mean this is not something that I'm going to check up on you and make sure you did it this way, but I'm going to you know, talk a little bit and then I'm going to suggest to you that you pause the recording after I've asked you a question. And just like in class where we would pause and you'd work on something, talk to your neighbor, try to figure it out, and then we would come back as a group, uh, please do take that time. So if I ask you to pause, think about something, try to solve a problem, stop the video, make your attempt at it, and then come back and don't start the video until you've made that attempt because I know it sometimes feels like it would be, obviously it would be faster, and maybe it seems like it would be easier for you to just blow through the video and just listen to what I have to say and let me give you the answers. But most of the learning that you do in chemistry really comes from trying these things out. And you know, if you don't figure it out right the first time, figuring out where your thinking you know, was a little off. So we left off on this slide, um, and we were talking about these three different isotopes of hydrogen. So each one of these atoms here is a hydrogen atom. And each of these three versions exists in the universe, but they're not all equally common. So we left off talking about the fact that you can be a hydrogen that you just have one proton in the nucleus. You can be a hydrogen and have one proton and one neutron. You can be a hydrogen and have one proton and two neutrons in the nucleus. So the nature of a hydrogen atom is just having one proton. That is what defines hydrogen. And beyond that, you can have different flavors. So we refer to these different flavors of hydrogen as isotopes of hydrogen because they have different numbers of neutrons, but always the same number of protons. If you have one proton, you're hydrogen. If you have a different number of protons, you are not hydrogen. So what we were going to talk about when we got back together as a class is, all right, so we know that these three different isotopes would have different masses because you're adding things to them. So this hydrogen would be quite light because it's just made of a proton and an electron. This hydrogen atom would be heavier because it's got a proton and a neutron in its nucleus. So if you add more stuff, you add more weight. This kind of hydrogen is even heavier because it's got three things in the nucleus. Now in each case, there is also an electron traveling around, and, you know, kind of circling around like that, going around this nucleus. But if you look up at this chart up here, um, you'll see that we have listed the three different components of every atom. Every atom is going to be some combination of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And we've got listed what the charges are on those things. So every proton carries a single positive charge. Every electron carries a single negative charge. And every neutron is neutral, so it has no charge on it at all. We also have these two columns telling you how heavy each of these particles are. So here's a proton's mass in grams, a neutron's mass in grams. And you can see that the electron, when you look just at these numbers, the first part, it almost looks like the electron's heavier because you've got the electron having a mass of 9.11. But then what we have to look at is these numbers, these masses in this column, are in scientific notation. So if you're not familiar with that or you haven't seen it in a while, uh, it's definitely something that you need to get re-familiarized with. So I will try to um, post some problems just to get you up to speed on that. But quick review, if you're looking at a number that's written in scientific notation, the components of scientific notation are first you have a decimal number, and that's always a number between 1 and 10. So it's never as big as 10. Um, so it's going to be like 1 point something or 9 point something. It'll never be 10 point something. It'll never just be 0.67. So that's the first component of a number in scientific notation. So you have the decimal number, and then you always have times 10 to the something. And whenever you're doing times 10 to the anything, what you're really looking at is you're moving this decimal. Because if we were to multiply 1.67 by 10, you know, that's probably a simpler example. If we're multiplying it by 10, that would just mean we're going to take the decimal place 1 over here. Take 1.67 times 10, you're going to have 16.7.
if you were to multiply 1.67 times 10 times 10, you would have uh, 167, because that would mean moving the decimal twice. So scientific notation is always decimal number times 10 to the something, and the to the something exponent is what tells you where you move this decimal. So if you have an exponent that's negative, it's telling you to take the decimal to the left. So when we look at this number, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24, the times 10 tells us we're going to be moving the decimal somewhere. The 24 tells us how many places to move it. So we're going to be moving it 24 places. And the negative sign tells us we're going to be moving it to the left. So this is a small number. So that's critical. When you're looking at scientific notation and you see a negative exponent, it means you're going to have a smaller number once you do the manipulation to this, to this component. So if we were to actually try to write this out in conventional number form, we would see that we have to take this decimal, we're going to move it left because we have a negative sign here, and we're going to take it 24 places to the left. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. We'd be off the screen. And that's where we would move the decimal, and then we would put zeros in all those places. <clears throat> so the result would be a ridiculously tiny number in terms of grams for how big these things are, which makes sense because these are unbelievably small things. You cannot see an atom even with the best microscope. I mean, you can just get like a hazy view of it with the most powerful microscopes on Earth. So we know this is going to be a really small number if we're trying to weigh these particles in grams. So, and you can look down here, so that's why when you look at this, you're like, oh, electrons, it looks like they're the heaviest thing. Oh, no, they're not. Because when we look at our exponent, this is negative 28. So that means when we do this decimal movement, we have to move the decimal four extra places beyond what we did for these ones. So we're going to have 0 0.00000000000000, 27 zeros, 911. And that's going to be the mass of an electron. So electrons are, if these things are super small, electrons are ultra small. So when it comes down to it, electrons are so tiny that they almost contribute no mass to the atom. So the mass of the atom is really coming from the protons and the neutrons. They're much, much bigger, much heavier than an electron. And we see that reflected in this column over here, where we've got this thing that says relative mass. So we've got a more convenient way of weighing atoms. We don't really want to use grams because grams are really much too big a unit. So we have these units called atomic mass units, or AMUs. And we can use these to measure atoms, and you're going to get a much more manageable number. So the way we define these AMUs is we say that a proton has a mass of about 1 AMU. A neutron has a mass of about 1 AMU. We're going to see it's not exactly 1, but we're estimating right here. So about 1 AMU per proton, about 1 AMU per neutron. And the electrons, we essentially just don't count. They exist, but they're so small that they just don't contribute any mass. So if we apply that, this, this information in this column to these atoms, the mass of this hydrogen atom is basically just the mass of the proton in the middle, so about 1 AMU. This hydrogen atom is going to have a mass of about 2 AMUs, because it's got a proton and a neutron, and the electron really doesn't weigh very much at all. This hydrogen atom is the heaviest of them all, because its atomic mass is going to be about 3, because it's got three of these particles in the middle. So then we have the question, if we know the mass of this guy is about 1 AMU, 2 AMUs, 3 AMUs, I have left you guys with the, uh, the question of if all three of these versions of hydrogen, all three of these isotopes, were equally common in the universe. So you go out, you meet a bunch of hydrogen atoms, about a third of them are this kind of hydrogen, about a third of them are this kind of hydrogen, and about a third of them are this kind of hydrogen, how would you figure out the mass of the average hydrogen? So hopefully you had pondered that. Um, and if that were true, if about a third were this, a third were this, and a third were this, then you have a pretty straightforward um, problem of averaging. And you can really just take the masses. So the mass of this is about 1, about 2, about 3. You can add those three things together. 1 plus 2 plus 3. So that's 6. And then you would divide that 6 by the number of things. So we've got three different types of atoms here. So we do 6 divided by 3. That's going to give us 2. And that makes sense because the middle mass is 2, and then you've got some guys that are less and some guys that are more. There's equal numbers that are less and more, so the average settles right at the middle. 
And so that's what we would say. If all three of these kinds of hydrogen atoms were equally common in the universe, and somebody said, what's the average hydrogen atom weigh? You could say, well, the average hydrogen atom is two. Some of them are less, some of them are one, some of them are three, and some of them are two. So they're all kind of hovering around a mass of two. But in fact, if you look on the periodic table, you'll see a number in the box for hydrogen that says 1.00978 or something like that. So pretty much one. And so what that's telling you, what that number on the periodic table is telling you is essentially what's the average mass of hydrogen atoms. And it's skewed really close to one. So what that's telling you is that in the universe, you don't have equal numbers of all three of these kinds of atoms. If the average is being pulled much closer to one, which is the mass of this particular kind of hydrogen, that must mean these guys are much more common. So you may be familiar with the kind of traditional elementary school way of calculating an average. You add a number of things together, and then you divide by the number of things. That's not the kind of average we're going to use in this instance because we have to fold in that idea of not all these things are equally common. So we have to deal in, in those respects. So before we do that, I've got a little, little brief exercise just to drive home these concepts of what are the parts of an atom and how do we represent an atom. Um, so what we were going to do in class is I was going to throw these at you and kind of have you try and figure out what these different atoms are um, and what their parts are. So I've got three different atoms here. As usual, the components of every atom are protons, neutrons, and electrons. So you have some number of each of those things. And by knowing how many of those things you have, you can tell what is the element you're looking at. Um, you can tell which isotope, so which flavor of that element do you have. And you can start to figure out, OK, what's going on with our electrons, and how is that going to impact how that atom behaves? So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you try, you're going to pause the video after I'm done talking here, and you're going to determine what element is each of these pictures trying to show, what kind of atom is each of these things. So you're going to have to figure out what information tells you what sort of atom you're looking at. Um, and you're going to then figure out, looking at the electron configuration and how many electrons you have, um, whether or not each of these atoms is electrically balanced in the sense that, so if a proton has a positive charge, an electron has a negative charge, an atom is electrically balanced or neutral if you have equal numbers of protons and electrons. If for any of these atoms you don't think that's the case, you don't have the same number of protons and electrons, then you're looking at something other than what we call a neutral atom. In that case, if you're looking at something with an imbalance, you either have more protons than you do electrons, or you have more electrons than you do protons, you're looking at something called an ion. And so we're going to have to deal with those in a little bit. So pause the video, figure out what each of these three things are, and then come back and we will determine what we're looking at. OK, so hopefully you went to your periodic table, because that's where you're going to have to go. The periodic table is really kind of your, your reliable phone book, directory, miracle working tool in all of chemistry. And if we take an example of, say, this atom right here, we look in its nucleus, we see it has one proton. There's only one kind of thing that has only one proton, and that's a hydrogen. So just by knowing the number of protons, you know this is a hydrogen. So I see that it's the kind of hydrogen that has two neutrons. It's that particular isotope of hydrogen. Then the other piece of information I have is it has one electron traveling around. So I see one positive sign and one negative sign. That means that this atom is electrically balanced. There's no extra pluses. There's no extra minuses. So this is what I would call a neutral atom of hydrogen. All right, so we take this example over here. Um, so in this case, they've given you the hint. They've said, all right, this is a fluorine. So if you go to the periodic table and you look for the letter F, you will see that the letter F stands for fluorine and fluorines have nine protons. So they've really given you the same piece of information twice in this diagram, because all you have to know is if it has nine protons, it has to be a fluorine all day long. So then let's look at the electrical balance in this atom. All right, so how many electrons do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so in this case, I've got only nine protons, so I have nine positive charges hanging out in the center. 
but I've got 10 negative charges in the form of electrons circulating around. This is not an electrically balanced atom. Now that doesn't mean it's bad or, if it's, or it's a problem for the atom. It certainly is not, in fact. It just means it's not a neutral atom. It's not electrically balanced. It's not a situation where for every positive there is a negative. So this particular arrangement is what we would call an ion. The way you kind of want to think about atoms is they're born into the, universe, into the universe as neutral atoms. So the way they are first created, if you want to think of it that way, is they have equal numbers of protons and electrons. But in their travels through the universe, some of them are compelled to change that number of electrons. And we're going to see a lot of reasons why. This particular fluorine was born with nine protons and nine electrons. Somewhere along the way, it got access to an additional electron that it kind of pulled into itself. So now it's got 10. So for some reason, it felt motivated to get an extra electron. So you have to do that accounting with every atom and figure out, okay, first, what kind of atom is it? And then does it have equal numbers of protons and electrons? So is it a neutral atom? Or is it an ion? Is it something where the number of electrons is not the same as the way this thing was born? So we're going to do a lot more kind of messing around with that. So in some of these cases, we've been looking at the idea of um, you've got a particular element, you know, you've got a particular kind of atom. So for the hydrogen example, as long as an atom has one proton, it's going to be a hydrogen. But there are different flavors of hydrogens. There's different isotopes of hydrogens. So if you want to know, if somebody says, well, you know, okay, so there's different kinds of hydrogen, what's the average hydrogen? You can't answer that off the top of your head without some additional information. So had we been in class, we would have approached these couple of examples just to get us thinking, how do you figure out the average of something when it's not a straightforward case, when you're not just looking at, okay, I've got these three things, what's the average of these three things? Sometimes you're dealing with very large numbers of things, and to try and decide what the average of all those things is can be quite challenging. So I've got two questions here that we were going to do in class, these little, you know, kind of problem sets. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do these on your own. So you're going to pause the video again once I stop talking, and you're going to tackle both of these. So you're going to want to write out for me. So I would, you know, suggest that you please do this in your logbook so that I can see that you did it. Um, and you're going to try to figure out how would you approach the problem of determining what's the average weight of a human. Now, of course, I'm not overseeing you, so you could just Google what's the average weight of a human. But if you do that, make sure you can explain how they got that number. So you may just want to, it might actually be simpler and less time consuming, to just come up with a plan of your own. Like if you want to, if somebody said, can, can you just give me a rough idea, like what's, what's the average human weigh? How would you go about figuring that out for them? So that's your first task. Second task is, here is um, a bunch of grades that a student has in a class that I've been teaching. And these are, this is the grade breakdown, so these are the, all the work that people in the class have to do. These are her grades, so she hasn't taken the final exam yet, and she really needs to get a B in the class, because for her program, that's what she needs. And she's asking, all right, so I have the only grade I don't have yet is my final, and I need to know, can I get a B in this class? And if I can get a B in this class, what do I have to get on the final in order to get that B? So a couple questions here. Um, what would you tell her? So first of all, is it possible for her to get a B? Is it mathematically possible at this point in the semester? And do you, in order to answer that question and the question of what does she need to get on the final to get a B or better, um, do you need any additional information? All right, so you're going to tackle both these questions, write out your thinking, how you would approach this problem, um, and then you may not be able to solve it. In some cases, you may have to say, well, I'd need more information and this is the information I'd need. But take that attempt. When you've written down those things, Restart the video. We'll come back to it. Okay, so you're back. Hopefully you have tried these. Uh, we'll take this first one as an example, the average weight of a human. Now, there's a lot of ways to do that. Most of the time, so, you know, you look around the Earth, there's like 7 billion people here now. So it's not very likely that you're going to be able to go around and weigh every single human on the planet. So you're going to just have to take some subset of humans. So, you know, you may decide like, okay, well, let's, um, let's just sample like my family. All right. So I'm going to say like, well, my family gives kind of a range. Um, we've got small people, we've got large people, and maybe that'll be at least a rough estimate you know, of what an average human weighs. So in that case, you know, I may be able to do the straightforward average of just saying, okay, if I take my weight, my husband's weight, my older son's weight, and my younger son's weight, 
and I add them all together and I divide by four, then I'll get an average weight. The trick is if you're dealing with, like, let's say you're, you're trying to get an estimate of all seven billion people on the planet, or you're trying to get an estimate and you're going to use um, a larger population, right? So you look around and you say, all right, well, I'm going to estimate that, you know, like, I don't know, how many, uh, how many people are adults and kids? It's not really 50-50. There's more adults than there are kids. So I'm going to say, like, 75% of the people are adults, 25% are kids, and I'm going to kind of go from there. So you have to start taking that into consideration and saying, all right, with a large number of people, if I don't literally want to weigh each and every person, then the information I'm going to need is I need to know, you know, kind of the range of possible weights, like how little can a person be, how big can a person be, and then how common is each kind of person. You know, like are most people above 100 pounds? Are most people below 100 pounds? So we get to this idea of a weighted average. And we actually do the same thing with atoms. So when someone says, well, what's the average hydrogen weigh? It's not necessarily a super straightforward question. So when we do this with atoms, what we're trying to get at is what we call the average atomic mass or the atomic weight or the average atomic weight. It gets called a lot of different things. But what we're looking at here is when you go to the periodic table and you look up a particular element, um, so in this case, boron, you go to the, the box for boron and you look at the periodic table, you'll see that boron has a number in the box that says something right around 10.81. There's actually no units on it. So it's just a number that has a, a decimal part to it. And so what we know about boron is that there's two different isotopes of boron. There's two flavors of boron. And if you look at these, we've got boron 10 and boron 11. So you know, just kind of think in your head, like what does the 10 and 11 mean? Um, and go back to, you know, you may need to go back a couple slides, think about that. Like, what does a boron 10 look like if you had to sketch it out? What does a boron 11 look like? And then we're told here that if you very precisely measure the mass of the different kinds of boron, boron 10 atoms have a mass of about, well, not about, of 10.013 AMUs, okay? Boron 11s have a mass of 11.009 AMUs. So remember, boron 11s, um, all borons have the same number of protons. Isotopes just mean there's different numbers of neutrons. So a boron 10 has one less neutron than a boron 11. So a boron 11 is heavier, it's fatter. So the mass of a boron 11 is 11.009 AMUs. The mass of a boron 10 is 10.013 AMUs. Now, if you were just doing the conventional type of average, you might be like, all right, well, I'll add those two masses together and I'll divide them by two because I have two different things. The problem is that they're not equally common. So if you were to look around the universe, or look around the Earth anyway, you'd find that about 80% of all borons are this kind of boron, the heavier kind of boron. About 20% are the lighter kind of boron. So if you're just guesstimating this, before you jump into any math, you want to start kind of planning out, like, all right, what kind of answer am I expecting here, right? So if you know that if you grab up a, a random sample of borons, if you could reach into the air and grab a bunch of borons, about, if you grabbed 100 of them, about 80 would be boron 11s, and about 20 would be boron 10s. So that means if you want to find out what's the average weight, what's the average mass amongst all those atoms, well, the average is going to have to be closer to the one that's more common. There's a lot more of these heavier versions of boron. So they're going to kind of pull the average toward that end. And these guys are less common, so they don't get to have as much influence over saying, well, what's the average? You've got many, many, many more of these heavier borons and not as many of the lighter ones. So the way that we account for that is we have a formula that brings both those pieces of information together. We have a formula that combines how heavy is that particular isotope and how common is it. So that formula is down here. So in this example, what we've done We've taken these percentages and we've converted them to decimals. So that's, that's important because if you leave the percentage there, then your answer is going to come out with a percent on it. And you generally don't want a percent sign in your weight. Like nobody, I wouldn't go up to somebody and say, yeah, my weight is 124 pounds percent. That wouldn't make any sense. So we need to get this into a format that, that works just as a number without a percent on it. So the way you do that, if you want to take a percent and turn it into a decimal, you're just going to move the decimal two places this way. Because what this is saying is 19.8% is saying 19.8 out of 100. 
And if you take 19.8 and divide by 100, you're going to get 0.198. So that's where this number comes from. So what this first part of the formula is saying is, okay, the first isotope, boron 10, this is how common it is. 0.198 is its abundance. And then 10.013 is its mass, right? So I'm going to take those two things and I'm going to multiply them together. I have a second version of boron. I've got a second isotope. So I'm going to do a plus sign. So I'm going to do this for the first isotope. And then I'm going to say plus for my second isotope, 80.2%. So 0 0.802 is how common it is. And 11.009 is how much it weighs. And I'm going to multiply those two things together. Once I've kind of multiplied those out, I then can add them together. So then what I'm going to get here is my atomic mass. And what it represents is taking into account how common the different isotopes are, what is the average for the mass of this particular element. And so in this case, we get 10.81 AMU. Now if we paused during this problem and said, OK, if I were to predict about where my answer would be, this is going to make some sense to us, because we know that this is the more common isotope. So this is, the, this is the guy that's going to influence the average more. The average should be closer to the 11 end because these guys are so much more common. The answer should not be as close to this mass because these guys are not as common. They don't get to skew the average as much. And sure enough, 10.81, that's most of the way to 11. So we've got our atomic mass is 10.81. So then the question is, so we've got that, and that says, oh yeah, so if you go to boron's block on the periodic table, it says boron, 10.81 AMUs. So what I'll ask you right here is just to think, and you can again pause the video in a second to think about this. If someone said, okay, so that's the average boron, average for boron, average mass for boron, then I can go out and expect to find boron atoms, individual boron atoms, that are 10.81 AMUs exactly in terms of mass. So pause for a sec, think about that. You can... All right, so hopefully you pondered that. And when you look at this, so we often think like, oh, well, if that's the average of the numbers, then actually the average boron must weigh that much. But when we come back to our original numbers, we see that's not actually an option for a boron atom to weigh that much. The only options for boron atoms is they either weigh 10.013 AMUs or 11.009 AMUs. So this number, 10.81, is not representing what any specific boron atom weighs. We're just saying in the world of boron atoms, if you average them all together, you're going to get this number. So there isn't going to be any boron atoms that literally weigh this much. This is averaging them all together and factoring in how common are they and how much do they weigh. So this is something where you'll want to get really good at these atomic mass problems, um, using this information about how common is it, how much does it weigh, and generating that atomic mass. You do have a few problems about that. I will post you guys some more. And you're going to see the first quiz on atomic mass calculations on Monday. So at the end of lab on Monday, uh, it's going to be your first chance to demonstrate that you've got this concept down and that you can use it and manipulate these numbers. So please do some practice on that if you'd like to tackle that quiz. So now it's going to feel like we, we're jumping to something rather different. Um, but this is actually just a, a real-world applica application of the technology we use to generate these numbers. Because we're sort of like, okay, so you're just telling me that boron either is this kind of boron or this kind of boron and 80% are this isotope, and 20% are this isotope, and you're just taking that on faith. Like, somebody just told you that's true. But now we're going to look a little bit more at how do we know that's true? How did anybody find out that 80% of boron atoms are this isotope, and 20% are this isotope, when you can't see them? So one of the ways we can do this now is with these really cool techniques that use a concept called mass spectrometry. It's a mouthful. It's a tongue twister. And this is a little schematic of what one of these machines looks like. So the main parts are you would take a sample, like let's say you had a boron sample, and you're like, I'm wondering in my sample of boron how many of the different kinds of isotopes are in here. So what this machine does is you'll put your sample in here. Uh, it gets heated up until it turns into a gas. And then that gas is going to pass through a couple of these little accelerators. And one of the things that has to happen is that atom, those atoms that you're testing, that you've turned into a gas and you're going to shoot through here, you have to convert them into an ion first. 
Now we're going to look at how this works. So I want you to think about why we're turning them into ions. Because you're going to think about um, this question. So why do we turn these things into ions before we shoot them through this machine? And I want you to think of the kind of the counterexample of what if we didn't do that and we just shot a bunch of neutral atoms that have no overall charge on them? They're electrically balanced. What would happen to them if we shot them through this field? So now I'm going to explain how it works. Just keep that kind of pondering in the back of your brain. So what's happening is we turn these atoms into ions, which means we change the number of electrons that they have. Um, and in this case, we're going to talk about what happens when you turn them into a positive ion. So now these atoms are behaving as particles that are carrying a positive charge. Right? So what we're going to do here is we're following the universal law of the universe um, that states that opposite charges attract. So a positive and a negative are going to pull towards each other. But two positives are going to hate each other, and they're going to repel. Two negatives will also hate each other and will repel. So we've got a magnet set up here. Every magnet has a positive end and a negative end. And so we've got a magnetic field in the area between them. Now, if you shoot a positively charged particle into this magnetic field, and that positively charged, magnetic, that positively charged particle now is experiencing the force of this positive charge over here and this negative charge over here, what is a positive charge going to do as it passes into this magnetic field? How is it going to behave? Think about that. So if we have a positive charge entering this field, that positive charge should hate this positive charge. They should repel each other. So a positive charge entering the field here should want to get away from this positive charge, so it should kind of veer to the side. On the other hand, it should like this guy. It should be into the negative charge, because positive charges are pulled towards negative charges. So that's what we're seeing as this beam is bending. We're watching positively charged ions come into this field, and they get repelled by this guy. So they're like, ooh, I don't want to be with that guy. And they get kind of pulled towards this side. So they just take this abrupt turn. And what you're watching here is we've got a bunch of little green beams. So we've got a bunch of separating beams. And they all end up hitting this thing that we're referring to as a detector. So now I want you to do a little mental experiment where you imagine that you've got several vehicles lined up. And they're all going to start down this, this road. Right? So you've got a Mack truck. You've got a pickup truck. You've got a sedan. You've got a low-to-the-ground race car. And you've got a motorcycle. Right? So this whole array of different vehicles, think about what makes them different from each other. Every one of those vehicles is going to get up to speed, get up to 70 miles an hour. Right? So highway speed, uh, motorcycle all the way up to the Mack truck. Unexpectedly, as they're driving down this road, they get to a sharp turn. Right? So you know they don't all have to reach it at the same time. But as you imagine each one of these vehicles trying to make a sharp turn at 70 miles an hour, I want you to picture what's going to happen to the Mack truck if it tries to make a sharp right at 70 miles an hour. What's going to happen to the pickup truck if it tries it, the sedan, the race car, and the motorcycle, making a sharp right at 70 miles an hour. Right? So picture that in your head. We all have a, surprisingly amount, a surprising amount of intuition about these things because we've just seen objects in our universe and how they behave. So you probably can picture that a Mack truck trying to make a turn on a dime at a high speed is not going to make that turn. It's probably going to blow through the guardrail and end up in the ditch. right? The motorcycle's probably going to make it. If anybody has a chance, it's the motorcycle. The race car probably too, because they're sort of designed for that. So those smaller vehicles, the ones that have less mass, are more likely to make that turn. Because the more mass you have, the harder it is for you to change directions. Because the amount of mass that you've accelerated up to 70 miles per hour, it wants to continue in a straight line. And the more mass you have, the harder it is to force it off of that straight line. So that means that if you were to watch those vehicles, you'd kind of see tracks sort of like this. You'd see maybe the Mack truck doesn't quite make the turn. It kind of jumps the guardrail and ends up in the ditch. Whereas the little light motorcycle makes the turn pretty well and is able to make that corner and get to the destination. And the different vehicles in between, of the masses in between, they're going to kind of be intermediate. So this is the same thing that we do in mass spectrometry. Uh, we take these different atoms. So we've got, say, a sample of boron. Boron comes in different isotopes. 
Some of them are heavier than others. So some of them are the Mack trucks of the boron world, and some are the little motorcycles of the boron world. The bigger, the heavier the atom is, the heavier the ion is, the less likely it is to be able to round that turn and nail it. They're going to tend to try to take the corner, but not really be able to turn on a dime. So the heavier atoms are going to end up hitting the detector out at this side. The lightest are going to end up taking the corner really well and hitting the detector down here. And the ones that have masses in between are going to end up hitting the detector in between. So the detector senses where those beams hit and can figure out, all right, how many of the atoms were this heaviest kind that hit up here? How many times did I get hit at that location? How many times did I get hit at this location? Because that means those were the lighter, the lightest atoms. And how many hit in the in-between ones? So the reason why we turn these things into ions is if you shoot a particle through here that has no charge on it, that's just a neutral atom, it's not doesn't have a positive or a negative charge on it, it's not going to feel anything as it passes through this magnetic field. So it's not going to be forced away by the positive charge, and it's not going to be pulled down by the negative charge. It's like, you know, if you try to stick a magnet to a piece of wood, there's no attraction there. So if you shoot a neutral atom through your mass spec, you're just not going to get anything because it doesn't respond to the magnetic field. So if you turn your atoms into ions, they're carrying some kind of positive charge on them, they're going to react when they pass through this magnetic field, and they're going to try to take the corner. The heaviest ones are not really going to make it, and they're going to end up out here. The lightest ones are going to make the turn the most abruptly, and they're going to end up down here, and the masses in the middle are going to be here. So the kind of thing you get as a readout when you use one of these mass specs is something like this. So we've got a graph here. Um, we're graphing the mass number of the isotope. So the mass number, well, I'm going to kind of leave that to you to make sure you know what that is. So we're graphing mass number, and then we've got relative abundance. So what this is saying is, what did that detector detect? So the higher the percentage, your mass spec is saying, there were a lot of these. I got a lot of hits at that location on the detector. I got a lot of that particular mass of atom. So you're going to look at this graph. Um, and what you're going to do, so we, we would have done this in class. Um, and we would have done it as like a paired problem solving example. But unfortunately, it's a snow day, so we can't do that. So for this one, definitely, I want you, when I'm done talking, to pause the video. You're going to tackle this, answer the questions on the right side of the slide, um, and try to come up with an answer to these questions. Then what we're going to do is when, I, when you come back, when you've done your attempt at solving this problem, um, you're going to hear my explanation of how I would solve it. Your job is, as you're listening to me try and solve the problem, you're going to act as the listener in the whole paired problem solving thing where there's a problem solver and a listener. So your job as the listener, and you're going to write this in your reading logbook as well, is to listen to me as I solve the problem and not write down every little thing I say, but just listen for what strategies I use when I solve a problem. The way you solved the problem might look very similar or you might have done things very differently. Now, I don't want to brag, but by the definition of expert problem solver, I am one. So we're going to see kind of how an expert problem solver does it versus how somebody who's new to these problems solves it. So pause the video, make your attempt at answering these questions, uh, and then when you've made your attempt and written it down in your logbook, come back, listen to me solve the problem, and write down what strategies I seemed to use and how I approached it. All right, so you're back. You're ready. You've tried to solve the problem. Maybe you did solve the problem. Uh, I'm now going to go over how I would approach this. And um, I'm going to kind of work out. And I, I don't have the luxury of being able to show you how what I would write down, but I would do a lot of writing down. All right, so example of mass spectrometer output. All right, so that's what I'm looking at. One of these mass spec machines that I just learned about. And I'm not kidding. I basically did just learn about these because I'm not a chemist, but I think it's really cool. So this mass spectrometer's output is showing me for this particular sample that they put in the machine, the detector was reading that there are four different flavors, so four different isotopes of whatever this element is. Um, so I've got a little readout at 84. So um, mass number, so mass number is not the same as mass. So I gotta figure out what I'm looking at on this graph before I approach too much of it. Mass number of isotope 
is telling me how many things are in the nucleus. So I've got 88 protons and neutrons in the nucleus of these kinds of atoms, 87 in this one, 86 in this one. Apparently there is no such thing in this particular readout of atoms that have 85 things in the nucleus. It's interesting. And then there was like a tiny number of them that had 84 things in the nucleus. Now, I usually want to know how many protons something has because that'll tell me what element it is. And this doesn't give me that because the mass number can't provide me with that piece of information. It's telling me the total of all the things in the nucleus. And some of them are protons and some of them are neutrons. So at this point, I don't know what this element is. Um, so I'm going to keep that. I'm going to jot that down. Don't know what element it is. But I do know there's four isotopes that were detected by the mass spec. And then my y-axis says relative abundance percent. So that's going to show me how many hits the mass spec got on the detector for those different masses of this particular element. So the heaviest atoms are the ones that are 88. And it looks like those are definitely the most common. So if this is above the 80 line, not all the way to 90, so that's maybe 82%. So 82% of the atoms that passed through this mass spec were this kind. They were the 88 isotope. This next one, 87, that looks like uh, maybe 8%. So 8% of them were the 87 isotope, the 87 variety. 10% were the 86 variety. And maybe 1% were the 84 variety. OK, so I've got four isotopes. They have different masses. The most common one is the heaviest. Uh, and the lightest one is the least common. So the questions I'm being asked, how many isotopes are there of this element? There's four that the detector picked up. What element do I think it is? I don't know yet. So I'm noting that down as something that I need to target and look up. And then what is the atomic mass of this element based on these data approximately? So I'm going to think about how would I find out what element this is? Now, I, the, the number of protons is buried in this. But I don't know like how many of those are neutrons and how many are protons. Like, Could there be 44 protons in there and 44 neutrons? Yeah, maybe. Could there be 50 and you know 30 whatever? I can't do head math very well. Um, could it be? Yeah. So I don't have enough information yet to say what kind of element it is. But I might be able to get there. So this is asking me, what is the atomic mass of this element based on these data approximately? All right, so the atomic mass is that number on the periodic table in each box. And so if I knew the atomic mass, so if I could figure out the average mass of all these different atoms of this element, I could take that number, that atomic mass number, and go look for it on the periodic table. And once I found it, then I'd know what element I'm looking at. So I can use this max spec data to kind of work my way backwards to what I'm trying to find out. So atomic mass, I know that's the number on the periodic table that's like the decimal number. How do I get there? All right, so we learned a formula for that. There was the formula that said you need to know how common that isotope is and what it weighs. Multiply those two together. Then add how common the next isotope is and what it weighs. Multiply those two together. Then add the next set, how common the third isotope is and how much it weighs. And keep going until you've done all your isotopes. So in this case, those pieces of information that I have, um, I've got this isotope, and if the mass number is 88, that means there's 88 protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. And since I know each proton and neutron has a mass of about 1 AMU, I can say that this kind of whatever this element is, the mass of that particular isotope is about 88. I'm just going to kind of, I don't know exactly because I know it's not exactly 1 AMU, but about 88 AMUs is what this kind of isotope weighs. These guys weigh about 87 AMUs. These guys weigh about 86 AMUs. And these guys weigh about 84 AMUs. So that's half the information I need. And to get how common they are, I'm going to use these numbers that I figured out. So if I want to work my way through these, I would set up my formula and say, all right, 88 AMUs times, so 82%. If I convert that to a decimal, it's going to be 0.82. So I would take 0.82 multiplied by 88. Then I do a plus sign. And I'd take, uh, how common is this guy? About 
8%. So 8% converted to a decimal is 0 0.08. So 0 0.08 times 87, because that's how much these guys weigh. I'll multiply those together. Then I'll do another plus sign. I'll take 86 times, so 10% would be 0 0.10 as a decimal. Multiply those together. And then my final one, I do another plus sign and say 84 times, I think that's about 1%, so that would be 0 0.01 as a decimal. And then if I do all that multiplication and addition out, I should get what this isotope is. Uh, and I don't have my calculator in front of me right now, so I'm held in suspense. Um, but hopefully you guys aren't. Hopefully you got it. And if you didn't get it, then hopefully my explanation is helping you get it. And we'll all kind of revisit this when we come back together. So make sure in your reading logbook you have your response to this problem, how you tried to solve it and then your notes as the listener on what I did in order to solve this problem. So this is that exercise. Anytime I ask you guys to do TAPS problem solving, um, this is what you want to do. You want to either listen to somebody else solve the problem and write down how they did it, or you want to be the problem solver and talk, talk it all out as you go. Everything that comes into your head, you say it, and then the other person writes it down. So with that, um, hopefully you guys will be in good shape. We will be starting um, the next chapter on Monday. So if you haven't finished your reading on chapter two, please get that done. Get everything in your logbook for that because things are going to keep moving really fast from here on out. It's going to get pretty intense and I want you guys to be in a good position for that.